Uh, my name is Karen, um, and um, I'm very glad that all of you could be here, or can be here, um, and that everyone arrived safely. Um, so, um, I think this workshop is really quite close to our hearts because, um, you know, it took us a while also to get our nomination up, and when Andrew floated this idea of, you know, have us having been hosting this, um, I was quite excited that we could actually bring everyone here um, to to actually get this training from Ray. So I hope that you benefit from it and that you know these two days will be a good time for us to network and also get to know each other better. Um, and feel free to ask any questions along the way. Um, we will be setting up uh, a laptop later at the back that will show uh, clips of uh, the Kathy Chris collection um, and also of things that we have already been preserving along the way. So you get to see things um, from the AFA collection in. And um, I suppose, you know, if you have any questions about what we do and all that, uh, my colleagues are around and you could just chat with us during tea and, and lunch. Um, and so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Andrew and we'll start with the program. Right. Thank hey, thanks so much, Karen. Um, so my name's Andrew Henderson, I'm from the UNESCO office in Bangkok. So um, first of all, I just want to say what it's a, a pleasure to have you all here. And I'd like to just thank you all for joining and coming and traveling to Singapore to be here for this training. Um, I'd also like to thank the National Library Board who are our sponsors. So I'm not sure we can give them a round of applause. And also the Film Archive, um, who have helped organise this event today. If you have time, perhaps we can visit the Botanical Gardens, but this is a physical, tangible cult uh, cultural heritage. We also have a program for intangible cultural heritage. So this is concerned with kind of dances, music, cultural expressions. And last but not least, we have the Memory of the World program. So this is what we're uh, discussing in the workshop. And here we're concerned with documentary heritage, which can be books, manuscripts, films. So I'll go into a bit more of an explanation of this later on. And of course, at UNESCO, we like to somehow separate these different categories of heritage, but we know they're interrelated. So I just wanted to share with you this nice illustration of an example of how these three types of um, heritage relate. And this is from Hue in Vietnam. We have here on the left the uh, image of the temple, uh, uh, sorry, not temple, uh, the palace um, complex, which was uh, recognized as World Heritage in 1993. In the center, we have the uh, court music, which is an ongoing practice of intangible cultural heritage, which was recognized on the Intangible Cultural Heritage Register in 2008. And we also have here the woodblocks of the Nguyen Dynasty, which is uh, the documentary cultural heritage, which uh, is the written form that complements uh, this whole story. So we see we have these three um, different ideas of heritage that are interrelated. So what types of documentary heritage are there specifically on, on this document memory of the world program? So we can have textual items, so manuscripts, books, newspapers, posters, non-textual items such as drawings and prints and maps. We can even have digital, digital documentary heritage, web, bases, uh, web pages and databases. Um, and then of course, audiovisual uh, documentary heritage, which can be films, discs and tapes. And as Ray said in his introduction, somehow uh, the audiovisual heritage within this Memory of the World program hasn't received as much attention um, as kind of textual or more manuscripts uh, and this kind of thing. So through this workshop and having you all here, we're hoping to 
uh, have more of a focus on the audiovisual heritage within the program. So I just wanted to share with you um, a bit on the background of how the program started because I think this kind of helps um, uh, explain the purpose and objectives of this program. So in the early 1990s, um, UNESCO and other international organisations were increasingly concerned by um, kind of threats to the preservation of the world's documentary heritage. Um, and these threats came from natural disasters, from war, from uh, kind of technical challenges in obsolescence. And here, I think this was one of the catalysts, this image um, shows the uh, destruction of the National uh, University Library of Bosnia in 1992. And over 1.5 million books and manuscripts were destroyed. Um, and this was the centre of the kind of cultural knowledge of the Bosnian people. So this was a really um, tragic event that was the catalyst for creating this program. So the program began with this uh, vision. Uh, it began in 1992 uh, with the vision that the world's documentary heritage belongs to all and it should be preserved for all, protected for all and should be accessible to all. So really it was a global attempt to uh, work together with different countries and organisations to face this challenge and threats and come up with a way of um, preserving and providing access to documentary heritage. So um, how was this vision kind of turned into a reality? So what, what were the objectives of the program? And so the first main objective is to facilitate preservation um, by the most appropriate techniques. And this is done through kind of direct assistance, um, disseminating advice and information and encouraging training, like the workshop we're having here today. And then linking sponsors with uh, projects. The second uh, kind of main objective of the project is to assist in access. So here we have the two, I think, main key themes of the Memory of the World program, preservation and access. Um, and this is done through encouraging uh, the digital copies of um, documentary heritage to be made and to be disseminated um, on the internet, also in publishing and distributing books um, and other products. I think the third main objective of the pro uh, program is to increase awareness about the significance of documentary heritage. And then I guess the most um, prominent way this is done is through the Memory of the World registers. And following my presentation, Ray is going to explain a bit more about how the registers work and go into more detail there. But uh, information is also um, uh, shared and awareness increased through uh, publications. So I just have here um, one example, I just distributed the audiovisual archiving philosophy and principles and we're lucky to have Ray, the author here. Uh, he may sign your copy later on if you're nice to him. But, uh, so this is just one example of uh, kind of a guidelines and support and principles that UNESCO um, supports um, for documentary heritage and in this case relating to audiovisual archiving. Here's another publication uh, relating to the inscriptions on the Memory of the World Register from the Asia Pacific from 1997 to 2013. Yeah. And again, we're lucky here to have Ray, and I think who was part in, part of the publication, and also Nick, 
I believe you were uh, at the early stages of this publication. Early stages. Early stages. So we have uh, two experts who have been involved. I have a copy here. So you can pass this around. Um, you'll notice again, there's not so many inscriptions relating to audio-visual heritage yeah, or film. Close, so we oh, hope right. when we do the next publication, maybe next year, we'll have perhaps some of your collections included in this publication. You can download it um, free of charge at this link. Um, so later on, if you want to collect the slides for me, you can get the link and download a copy, as well as the audio-visual archiving is available if you want to share through your networks as well, please do so. <coughs> so now I just wanted to share just um, some of the structures of the Memory of the World program, how it operates. And it, it operates really on three levels on the national level, the regional level, and the international level. So I'll just, uh, just share with you, on the national level, um, there's a network uh, of national committees that have been set up in around 60 countries around the world. And these national memory of the world committees uh, normally comprise of uh, representatives from archives, libraries, museums, NGOs, and uh, other experts, and they help coordinate national memory of the world activities uh, such as events, uh, research projects, development of publications, and they often manage national registers. So here, if we look on the bottom right hand side, there's a, uh, an image of a publication uh, from the National uh, Committee of Australia and this publication was created when they reached 50 inscriptions on their national register. Which is here. Uh, Ray has a copy. Maybe we can pass this around as well. So you know. And you can see when you look through this publication, I think it's quite interesting that there's a lot of collections from the large national archives um, and institutions, but there's also very small collections that have been recognised um, and perhaps uh, they may not have been as well known if they hadn't been as part of, the, part of this program. So it really helps to raise awareness about the different collections around Australia. Um, in terms of the national committees, um, up the top right hand corner you can see an image of the logo of the National Committee of Timor-Leste. So this national committee was formed last year, the end of last year. So I think it's the first national committee, and um, they're do doing a lot of activities relating to the memory of the world, implementing the memory of the world. So I think for you all here, um, in I think your countries, perhaps there's some that have set up a national committee that you can engage with and work with. If not, there's also the national uh, UNESCO uh, memory of, uh, sorry, national UNESCO Commission, sorry, and they also help to implement the Memory of the World program. So um, you have some contacts there um, that are working with the Memory of the World. On the regional level, um, there's a uh, regional committee and it covers the whole Asia Pacific area. So here there's a map that illustrates the different uh, countries that are part of the program. So you can see it's really a vast uh, expanse. It's a very large region and diverse region. And this committee was established in 1998 and it works to implement the uh, program in the region and holds workshops, uh, provides training. And there's actually a really nice uh, website you can visit here which uh, gives some information about the program. And, and so, a brochure as well. So, we'll pass this around, take one. Yeah. <laughs> the current chair of the committee is the head of the National Archives of China. Um, and Ray is also on the committee as a special advisor. Um, but yeah, I do encourage you to look at the website. Um, 
and have a browse through. You can also contact if you'd like more information or to make links with this committee, you can uh, contact the malcap.info at gmail um, if you'd like. So on the international level, um, there's an inter international advisory committee that helps implement the program um, at this global level and this comprises of 14 experts in the field of documentary heritage. And this um, committee helps to advise UNESCO on how the Memory of the World Committee should be, uh, Memory of the World program should be implemented. And also for the international inscriptions um, uh, for the register, the international register, uh, this committee advise, uh, provides recommendations to the UNESCO Director General on what should be included on this register. And so from UNESCO's side, um, the Memory of the World program is operated by the Communication and Information Sector, which has an office in uh, Paris, um, and also the field offices. So I'm working here in the Bangkok office and uh, the countries that the Bangkok office is uh, is working with uh, Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Singapore, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And the head of this sector is uh, Masako Ito, um, who you can uh, email or contact regarding anything uh, memory of the world in that region, also to myself. Um, we also have an office in Jakarta, uh, and then this office is uh, working with Brunei, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Timor-Leste. And Mr. Ming uh, Kwok Lin is in charge of the program there. So you can contact them with any queries or if you'd like to uh, look at cooperation or any kind of program. So I encourage you to, to contact them. So just to finish off my uh, presentation, I wanted to just focus specifically on what UNESCO is doing relating to audiovisual um, archiving and documentary heritage. So I think, uh, I think most of you or some of you may be aware of the Coordinating Council of Audiovisual Archives Associations, a bit of a mouthful. But uh, this, uh, the CCAAA is working uh, with UNESCO through the Memory of the World program along with the uh, International Council of Museums and the International Council on Archives and the International Federation of Library Associations. So these associations help um, inform the Memory of the World program and provide expertise um, to help guide the program. And one example of this is that a CCAAA nominated expert is part of the international uh, uh, advisory committee um, that helps assess nominations. And um, UNESCO and the CCAAA often cooperate for programs um, such as the World Day for Audiovisual Heritage. So this is another initiative from UNESCO. I think perhaps some of you may have done events for this uh, celebration on the 27th of October. Um, and this marks the uh, day that the UNESCO General Conference adopted the recommendation for safeguarding and preservation of moving images. So this was a very kind of important landmark step in the preservation of audiovisual heritage. And on the left there you can see there's a special logo that is used for the celebration of this day. And here's a photo of me and um, also the head of the Thai Film Archive um, and also uh, Sanchai, who some of you may know, and also the head of the Public Relations Film Archive. And last year we did a celebration of, uh, between UNESCO and the Thai Film Archive um, for the 27th 7th of October. We had a film screening and invited the media along to share the message 
about why it's important to preserve audiovisual heritage. So um, I guess my question that I hope to ask you later on in the discussion is if you have any plans for the 27th of October to celebrate. If not, what can we do? Do we have any ideas? Perhaps um, we can share this experience, our own experience of celebrating this um, later on in the afternoon session. And this is my uh, final slide, and this is um, a kind of new project from UNESCO um, that is being done by the UNESCO office in uh, Paris, the UNESCO headquarters, and it's the African Film Heritage Project. And this project um, aims to identify significant films within Africa using uh, criteria of yeah, significant artistic and cultural or historic significance and then work towards restoring these films and then presenting them back to people in, in Africa who may not have seen these films before. And it's a partnership between UNESCO and the Film Foundation, which was started by Martin Scorsese and also the Pan-African Federation of Filmmakers. And so their plan is that from this identification of these significant films, that they will also work to develop support nominations to the Memory of the World registers. So um, I think the project is in its early stage, but I think it's a really nice model of cooperation between different organisations. So again, in the afternoon discussion, I hope perhaps we can uh, look at what can be done in our region here and come up with some ideas as well. So that was my last slide. So thank you very much. And I think um, <laughs> Nick Ray is going to continue on to talk. Let's see the oh, yeah, some questions. So, yeah. Any That's questions? Quite a lot to take in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a so any questions about the program as a whole? It's actually quite a large program now, with all those committees around the world, and um, it's, it's almost entirely run by voluntary effort. Uh, very few people actually pay you know, to, to do this. Um, and so the um, around the world, there are many national registers, there are regional registers, and international register, but then there, there are all the other activities, such as publications, uh, and training activities uh, that, that happen all around the world as well. Uh, there's also, and this is quite recent, uh, a piece of UNESCO legislation which has a hugely long title to try to remember for the recommendation uh, uh, on the preservation of and access to documentary heritage including digital heritage. Now I'm trying to remember that. Um, that's a really stupid title anyway. This is what, what happens when you know, lawyers get, get onto these things. Anyway, this was adopted at the end of 2015, and it basically says to all countries and all governments, you need to look after your documentary heritage, and we're now going to keep asking you what you're doing about it. Okay? So that's UNESCO saying to all governments, to all member countries, um, that this is world's best practice looking after your documents, including audiovisual documents. And you will be asked to report on a regular basis on how well you are doing it. Uh, so that's, you can actually look this document up and you can read it. And it's quite hard to read because it's very legal in the way it's spelled out. <coughs> but um, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a groundbreaking event that this happens. Uh, because it means that, that um, the things that governments take seriously are often things like you know, economics and trade and things like that. <coughs> UNESCO is saying, well, okay, that's all very well, but your documented heritage is your memory, your national memory, uh, and we're taking that seriously as well. And it's time to, to look at what you're doing. So, um, recently in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Andrew and I were there, um, uh, we had a consultation about how this recommendation is to be implemented in ASEAN countries. 
was very large meeting and uh, we discussed very carefully how this piece of legislation is to be put into practice in different countries. Um, and there'll be more, you'll hear more about this as time goes on. So this is um, an, out, an outworking of the Memory of the World program taken to, a, if you like, a legislative level to say, okay, we are quite serious now about how countries look after their documentary heritage because it matters to each country that you protect your memory. So um, uh, that's, the, that's the sort of general scope of, of memory of the world. So we're just dealing with a particular part of it here um, at this, at this, uh, this workshop. Uh, any any questions about here, Lisa? Uh, I'd like to know how. Could you explain a little bit? Maybe the story is uh, slightly different in different countries or parts of the world. But how are the committees um, formed? Okay. Yeah. And whether they have, um, I don't know, connection to one another. Hmm. Okay. Um, international level. The committee is formed um, by people chosen by the Director General of UNESCO. Um, uh, in practice, she has given a long list of people compiled by the Secretariat, um, and she makes a choice. Um, but the, the, the net effect is that you get 14 people that are spread around the world and come from different um, academic or cultural backgrounds, different knowledge. So you'll have historians, librarians, archivists, or whatever. Um, the intention is to try to cover the field of documentary heritage as, as well as possible. That's the International Committee. The other, all committees work autonomously, so the regional, so the, I'll come back first now the National Committees. National Committees are set up by the National Commission for UNESCO in each country. And the National Commission basically determines the rules and how people are chosen. And it varies from country to country, so committees take on different flavours depending on the country. I can tell you the one I know best is the one in Australia, of course. Um, that was set up by our National Commission, and uh, people are appointed by the National Commission. Again, there's um, an endeavour to make the spread of backgrounds and expertise, and um, people in Australia are appointed as individuals not as representatives of bodies. In other countries, sometimes they're appointed as representatives. It really depends on how they want to set it up. In Australia, I guess, um, because it's a big country, and this is probably unique, um, while the committee meets in Canberra, the national capital, half of its members are uh, scattered around the country in the state capitals. And so when we have a meeting, a large part of that meeting is a teleconference with all the other people sort of phoning in. That's, that's how it works. Now that's a practical necessity for Australia, not necessarily other countries. Um, in Australia we have a national register, we produce publications, we produce events. We recently mounted a large exhibition in a museum to demonstrate the various things inscribed in the Australian register and so on. And we try to get publicity for the documentary heritage in one way or another in Australia. Uh, we also, when we feel we need to, Will provide advice to the government or to other parties about how things are being looked after. So, um, so, and we uh, so that committee operates autonomously. It's only linked with the the international program. Is it reports every year? So the annual report to Mount Capital Regional Committee and to International. And um, that's about it. It has to observe the general guidelines. Um, this is the, the rule book. Do I have, a, do I have it here? Okay, that's that's not negotiable. It must observe the rules. 
Um, <coughs> they're currently being revised um, and updated because this was done in 2002. A few things got out of date since then. Um, but that's the reference point for every committee. Beyond that, the committees are autonomous. Now we come to the regional committee, which is MOCAP, the Committee for Asia Pacific. All the national committees within the Asia Pacific region are automatically members of MOCAP. They have one vote. They send a delegation to the, the biennial general meeting, which is every two years. Uh, the next one will be in Korea next year. And uh, all the national committees will be asked to send one or more people to that meeting. Excuse me, so the Asia Pacific, for example, the yeah. committee for Asia Pacific are nominated by each national commission. Nation. So for, for Asia, Asia Pacific, each national committee, national member of the World committee, um, is automatically a member of the regional committee. And uh, for the general meeting every two years, it sends somebody to represent each country. Um, <clears throat> so I think there are currently about 18 national committees in, in the region. And um, so they will all be there in Korea next year. Uh, there's, there's quite a long agenda. The meeting will last for three days. And it includes um, adding inscriptions to the regional register, uh, which takes some discussion and some time. And there's a process by which that happens. The MOCAP has a register subcommittee which does the initial processing of nominations, to see where they match criteria, and then it comes to the, the main committee for a decision. Um, and in that decision, people vote, and each country has one vote. So, um, MOCAP has actually <coughs> has grown quite a lot. Um, there are now interesting offshoots of MOCAP. So there is a MOCAP center in Korea, it's a physical place. Um, only just recently established, but our, the, its records will be held there and um, a lot of its administrative activity will, be, will come from that, that place. And then there are knowledge centers. And the first one was in Macau, I think last year. Um, Another one will open this year in Beijing. And these are research places, study points, um, uh, with literature and um, encouraging research into documentary heritage, particularly the things that have been described in registers. So, and then there are workshops um, every year, uh, somewhere in the region, sometimes beyond. There will be a, a workshop held like this one, very similar to this one to um, assist um, people in preparing nominations. And it focuses on countries that are not yet visible on any register. So it's kind of an initial mentoring and help to help people nominate something. <coughs> um, they've been held around the region. Um, most of them so far have been sponsored by Korea, some by China. And um, they've resulted in, I think, some very interesting nominations finding their way to the register and maybe breaking down some barriers one of the fascinating things last year this was the result of a workshop was we put it on the regional register the first the first nomination from north korea and i thought what that would have, you know with all the other walls that exist around the world we got through that one <laughs> it's fantastic so it's interesting how dealing with documentary heritage kind of gets past other barriers because we all have an interest in a shared memory. And uh, we, we, that's something that, that belongs to all of us. And so we see our way through that. <coughs> so that's how the regional register, the regional committee works. We have um, an interesting way of, in MOCAP, of deciding what goes on the register. And this is unique. Um, when all the arguments have been presented and so on, have the report of the register subcommittee and countries nominating, uh, putting up the nomination also have a chance to speak to the whole meeting. And then we vote by secret ballot as to whether each nomination meets the criteria. That's how we do it. Uh, no other committee does this, but we felt that was the right way to do it. That's how we do it. Um, so it's, um, it has a newsletter, it has a website. Uh, you can look up the website, it's quite, it's quite a lot on it. And um, 
it is a network that's really very active and there's a lot of cooperation around that network and shared projects. Um, uh, but my favourite shared project, project is a very small one. We had um, someone from the Cook Islands. You ever heard of the Cook Islands? It's a tiny country in the Pacific. The population only about 24,000 people. It is a country. Okay. There are a lot of very small countries in the Pacific. Um, one of the people came to the workshop that we had in Phnom Penh. Uh, we helped her prepare her nomination. It went through the process. It was agreed, it was put on the register. What was it? It's a document of two pages. It is the founding document of the Cook Islands. It, it, it's what makes them a country. Okay? Very, very precious to them, and it was deteriorating. And in the Cook Islands, there are no conservation facilities, there's nothing. Um, and so, Two committees, uh, Member of the Committee Australia and New Zealand, collaborated to bring the document to New Zealand where it received conservation treatment and reframing, and to bring the curator to New Zealand to hand over and receive back the document. And um, the two committees managed to pay for this. It didn't cost a lot, a few thousand dollars, and the race made to pay for it. Why them and why not somebody else? It was nobody's particular responsibility to do that job. It wouldn't have got done otherwise. And so the committees took the initiative. So the Cook Islands now have their foundation document framed and served. Um, and that's, that's their identity. So these, these sorts of projects arise out of the contact that we have um, in MOCAP. And within a country, out of the contacts that happen uh, in the, among the members of the committee and the institutions in the country. And um, develops a lot of goodwill, uh, increases a lot of awareness, brings some publicity to things that otherwise nobody would have heard of, um, and uh, just raises consciousness a bit all the time. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Is there a chance here in this um, workshop that uh these things you talk about in terms of uh, awareness raising, uh, it can also be raised, it can also be brought up. Are there chances outside of nomination? And oh, we're going, to, we're going to discuss awareness raising and, and promotion. Okay. Yes, we are later today, so yeah. yeah. That will be exciting. Yeah. <laughs>